thanks, Marty, um, for the introduction. And um, yeah, I mean, NFTs, you know, has been the big, you know, uh, topic for 2021. So I've been really involved in that space. We have a great uh, intimate panel today uh, with some experts in the crypto assets as well as NFTs. So we'll see what we can address in the time that we have. Just to give you a little bit of uh, my intro, so I'm a co-founder of a company called Merch NFT. And what we aim to do is try to make NFTs easy. And as we'll hear about more about from our speakers today, NFTs right now are really confusing, complicated. There's these gas fees, hidden fees that are all involved. And you know, with the fluctuation of you know, cryptocurrency, it, it's just a lot to kind of chew on in terms of you know, dipping your toes into the space, whether as an investor or just trying to maybe sell you know, your kids' artwork. Um, so I'm in the space of where we tether, you know, physical merchandise with NFTs, trying to make it a little bit more palatable for the general public, you know, who are still a little bit unsure about what these are. Um, so that's what I do. Um, and so now let me introduce uh, everyone to our speakers. First, we have Ethan Pierce. Ethan is a general partner at Borderless Ventures, scaling French tech, CE, and ASEAN startups. Ethan is also a director at Crypto Assets Institute, where he advises governments, corporates, and investment funds on the blockchain economy. And he's also the former managing partner of Nest Venture Capital. Um, Ethan, I know the audience can only see uh, one speaker at a time, so I just wanted to give you a chance to say a quick hello and maybe introduce yourself a little bit more in terms of what you do with Crypto Assets Institute and the NFT space. Sure. So. Um, as far as the Institute goes, that comes out of an activity where I was working with a lot of um, corporates, uh, Nest, uh, based in Hong Kong and Singapore. We built a lot of accelerators with uh, DBS Bank, OCBC Bank, AI Insurance, companies like that. And, and this was you know, uh, 2015 to 2018, and that was really when a lot of the tokenized ideas started to really get exciting for helping things like the Unbanked. Um, things around cross-border remittance, uh, subjects like that. And so it kind of pushed me into the crypto space um, earlier than I might have uh, otherwise maybe thought uh, when I left Nest and started Borderless as to kind of continue that activity, but, but also then the, the Institute to really focus on helping organizations, whether it's governmental, uh, large corporates, or, or specifically investment funds, really understand um, the opportunities and the risks uh, linked around everything in the blockchain economy and crypto assets, and I'll split those up a little bit later when we when we get into that subject. But you know everything with enterprise blockchain or tokenized securities, decentralized finance, uh, um, all that kind of stuff. So it's really about uh, it, it kind of depends if it's corporates. A lot of times they're looking for how to how to really work with these business models and understand how that works. Um, and funds very often it's it's figuring out you know obviously if they want to invest in these companies, understanding what they're actually doing. Uh, but it's also sometimes understanding how to invest in these companies because because it's potentially not a typical term sheet uh, investment. Potentially, we're talking about tokenization uh, or other things. And so the, the idea there is that. And all of that's kind of wrapped up in a lot of media where I, I travel a ton speaking on the subject. Well, I used to travel a ton speaking on the subject. <laughs> um, but that'll come back. And then I also have the blockchain economy, which is a, kind of a top five non-crypto bullshit uh, um, blockchain podcast, where I talk a, about crypto subjects, but not really about speculation or, or that kind of stuff. So anyways, um, that's a quick version of that. Awesome, thank you, Ethan. And next we have Ty Murphy. Ty is a due diligence art and NFT advisor to ultra high net worth individuals as well as family offices. He's a former investigator and counter surveillance specialist and worked at a very senior level within the wealth space for the missile and arms manufacturers. Ty, could you uh, say hello to our audience and tell us a little bit more about what you do in the NFT space? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so. Um, I'm an art advisor, um, traditionally uh, with um, physical art. Um, NFT art is, uh, is something that's uh, become a necessity. Um, I've been um, advising family offices for a number of years and ultra high net worth individuals um, on um, all aspects of due diligence in, in fine art transactions, which has now led into us doing the very same thing with um, non-fungible tokens be uh, because, of course, of the um, gold rush, as some are calling it. So um, to do this, it normally involves um, gathering as much information as possible about any of the parties to a proposed um, transaction, the artwork itself. And that would include, of course, AML, KYC, um, also uh, looking out for sanctions. Um, <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> Who, whose side is that? <laughs> it's not mine. Um, so, uh, so no, we're, we're uh, no adding NFTs to our clients' portfolios, and of course, it's um, a new space um, for the uh, family offices and uh, ultra high net worth individuals, and who knows what to buy and when and where. Um, notwithstanding the the uh, uh, recent um, uh, successes with with Christie's and the 69 million sale, um, not all sales are like that. So uh, we're we we had to approach NFTs as a matter of necessity because the clients want to add NFT art to their existing collections. So that's about it in a nutshell. Thank you for that, Ty. Yeah, I, I try to um, mint my kids' uh, artwork and see if uh, someone will buy it. Maybe, maybe not sixty nine million, maybe uh, sixty nine dollars, but uh, it didn't even sell for that. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I bought the crayons. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. So I think um, I know NFTs and crypto assets have a you know whole you know technical aspect to that that we're probably not going to get into today. But I think it's important to kind of uh, set the scope of what we're trying to define and what we're talking about. And Ethan, I want to ask you um, first at a high level, if you can maybe talk briefly about crypto assets and how NFTs kind of fit into that and what you're seeing and why it's kind of booming, you know, all of a sudden. Yeah. So, um, you know, given that this is is not necessarily a uh, an audience that is focused uh, uh, entirely on the blockchain economy or on the crypto asset space, I think it's really important that we 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 uh, explain that there are a lot of things in blockchain that do not have a cryptocurrency or a token associated with it. So we do want to separate uh, certain blockchain um, technologies or use cases from the crypto concept that we're talking about. Um, so especially enterprise blockchain solutions, whether it's things around logistics or supply chain, health tech, digital payments, you know, there's a lot of things that are not necessarily tokenized. Um, what we're talking about there is the centralized trust authority idea, like maybe a database, uh, but also on the, that's on the technical side, but on the person side, we also can be talking about lawyers or notaries or other things where we're looking to replace that trust authority with a, a digital uh, autonomous kind of a trust authority anywhere where there's enhanced transparency or, or traceability uh, that could be of benefit. Um, if we move out of that space and we get into the crypto space, we're talking about a couple different things. So crypto assets is the umbrella term that covers things like cryptocurrencies. So stores of value and, and, and payment like Bitcoin. Uh, we can also talk about Ethereum, but then we also get into the frameworks and ecosystems that lots of stuff is being built on, like we just heard with the DeFi panel. So Ethereum, but also things like Algorand and Tezos and EOS and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And then if we move into kind of the third piece of what crypto assets is, it's, it's this place of tokenized securities, where we're pretty much looking at any real world asset that you can think of today, and we are creating a tokenized version of that uh, for all the benefits that we will see why that could potentially be interesting. And now obviously we have lots of virtual assets as well that are purely virtual. They're not a just a virtualized version of a, of a physical asset. So we'll get into that a little bit as well. So the whole idea there then is that NFTs, and, and I know Ty's gonna probably talk about this a little bit about the fungibility idea, but, but non-fungible tokens are a way for us to represent unique assets. Um, so one Bitcoin is like another, but uh, one potential collectible thing or something else is not. And so um, we wanna represent, represent those individually, whether it is a physical or a digital thing, we wanna tokenize that so that it can be purchased and traded like the cryptocurrency concepts people might already have some experience with. And so NFTs really are a version of this tokenized securities idea. They're not all necessarily going to be considered securities in that large sense, but we're talking about real estate, lots of intellectual property, uh, everything like patents or copyrights, trademark. Um, we could be looking at all kinds of other things. We'll talk about other things later, but you know, we're really just looking at how do we take an asset and you know, if we're looking at a condo building with, with 20 units in it, that's 20 units. But if we break it up into tokenization, maybe it's a million or a billion tokens that represent fractional access to those assets. This democratizes the access to these assets, really opens those things up. So tokenized securities are really, in my opinion, the future of where finance is going to go. And NFTs is, is one of the ways that we can make that happen by creating a tokenized version of these unique things. Thanks, Ethan. Ty, in terms of, and you mentioned Beeple and the 69 million, and I know you're in the due diligence space specifically with art. Why do you think that NFTs have blown up in terms of, as it relates to the art world? Could you say that again? Sorry. What, why do you feel like the NFT space has taken over in terms specifically with the art world? 
since you're in the art space um, in the NFT world. Yeah, we mean, why has it, 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 it well, it, it, it's amazing um, the, 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 the way NFTs have um, taken off recently. I mean, the, as we all know, they've been around um, for, for a number of years, but I, I think the, the gold rush, as it's called at the moment, is uh, because, partly because of, of, of um, the everyday first 5,000 uh, 5, days by people. And I, again, it's this back to the um, uh, 69 million. I mean, that was the first time. What's interesting is that, um, I, I mean, my experience is, is, is more the physical world than, of course, the, the, the crypto world. But, uh, but that was the first time that the Christie's Auction House had listed um, an entirely digital piece of work in its 250-year history. Now, that was a milestone um, for uh, non-fungible tokens and it caused a sensation all over the world. It's an interesting event in, 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 in NFT history, but it, it raises a question, uh, an interesting question about the auction house uh, route and how this deal was constructed and done. And was there what's referred to as a third party minimum guarantee arrangement in place? So um, an auction house um, normally sets this up between um, themselves and the seller. And, and that guarantees that the artwork will be sold at a certain price. So most art market participants know they'll run the risk when selling an artwork at auction that it may fail to sell. So the artwork is burned and less desirable to a number of people. So auction houses then created the third party guarantee as a solution to, the, uh, to that problem. Um, third party then hedges the sellers um, uh, uh, a risk of failure to sell at auction. But it's been long criticized as the auction house, in a sense, is bidding up on behalf of the seller. Now, notwithstanding that people had sold previous works, the astonishing sale of 69 million seems to have come out of nowhere. I mean, he has sold in the past. He, we, we know that there has been uh, um, um, sales in the past, but nothing like this. It would make sense if there was a third party auction guarantee in place that would guarantee that that, that particular artwork would have sold at a certain price. So every day was purchased, as we know, by uh, uh, um, uh, Vignesh Sandarin. I think I'm, I hope I'm not uh, mispronouncing his name. Uh, uh, a programmer uh, based in Singapore. And we all know he owns Meta Purse and is known for his student name uh, uh, Meta Coven. Um, I, I think what, what else has driven it is it, you know, they, 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 there's other events um, uh, uh, like the Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey. He jumped on board and auctioned his first tweet and Twitter's mm -hmm. first tweet. And Grimes, then better known as uh, Elon Musk's partner, um, sold uh, um, made six million from uh, um, selling in, in another um, uh, digital art backed by NFTs, as they say. So um, it, it's it's the the hype built around that sale, I believe, is what is after driving the, the, the gold rush at the moment. I mean, but, but that said, um, after scanning all the marketplaces, there's some wonderful pieces of art out there. But then, of course, there's the crayon brigade. brigade. You know, or, or, or as, you, as you said um, so rightly earlier, you know, you're trying to sell your kids art. So there's a lot of rubbish out there, but there's some really um, uh, uh, wonderful art out there. And, uh, and I suppose that would take us into, to, or if we look back at the Dada movement, the Dada movement was a movement um, going, going, going back many years ago of non-art, uh, or like Marcel Duchamp, uh, if, you, um, uh, uh, if you know anything about the guy. So it, it's, when you look at the, the NFT art market as a whole, you can see right that yes, it is going places, and yes, it is here to stay, and yes, it's going to be. I think I think it's, it's hyper volatile, uh, um, like uh, the other cryptocurrencies. Hey, Ty, can that's, I just that's my take. Uh, can you talk about like? I, I, so I don't know if um, if uh, the blockchain is helping with provenance. Is that part of this NFT movement? Or well, to... yeah, I mean, um, um, you, look, uh, uh, um, the, the oh. blockchain, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, 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 uh, from that perspective, the, the Christie's had um, uh, a, a, a set up um, a, a, with, oh, um, they, they, I think it's Artori. They set up um, a, a system where whereas, um, art is registered on the blockchain. Now, the problem with that being, of course, is that um, that information is only as accurate as the person who's actually putting it on the blockchain. So if someone, let's say, like uh, uh, Wolfgang Baltraki, he let's say he forged a painting and it was registered on, uh, 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 on the blockchain, then we've got a situation where there's false information put on there. 
So it's only as accurate. The blockchain is only as accurate as the people who are putting it on there or as. So, so one part uh, of it is provenance and the other part is um, disintermediation. Is that a driver behind uh, can it? You, yeah, I mean, let me turn the volume up. Sorry, can you repeat that? Is, is, is disintermediation playing a part in this where artists can go directly to the market? So let me finish my question. So provenance, disintermediation, um, and the ability for the artist to continually make money as sales are done over time. Uh, you know, I don't know, it's almost like a copyright, uh, some percent of funding. Are, are those all players in this market? And can you just discuss them? Right. Um, well, what, I mean, what are you talking about? You're talking about uh, um, uh, resale rights. Yes. Well, well resale rights, but also just tied to jump in there too. One thing that's very important with the NFT space is the fact that in the smart contracts, that are driving most of these things on a lot of platforms, we can bake in residual commissions, which means that uh, if somebody, you know, whenever the person who bought people's artwork wants to resell it, depending on the smart contract and what was kind of baked into that programmatically, uh, he will automatically get five, 10, 15, 20% of the resale, depending on the rules baked into the smart contract. That's defined by the smart contract, it's defined by the platform, it's defined by the individual sale, but that, that residual commission thing is definitely one of the innovations that NFTs brings to artwork sales. Yeah, well, I, I, I'd go with that. I mean, the, the, it's, it, the, the, um, the, the problem as well is when someone actually buys um, a, 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 an NFT art or an NFT work of art, as some call them, um, they're in a situation where they, they're not buying all rights. The, some of the rights are very limited. That they're 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 actually purchasing from the artists themselves. Mm. Um, you could relate that again back to the physical art world, where um, the Picasso estate, let's say, the the Picasso administration own all rights to all images of Picasso. So you're in a position. What happens when someone takes a Picasso and wants to turn that into an NFT? Um, there was a recent case there with the Basquiat, where someone um, tried to sell the Basquiat. I think it was an open sea. And um, OpenSea pulled it when um, they were informed by the Basque estate that they, uh, the Basque estate hold uh, uh, the copyright on the piece. So they pulled it immediately. So that was a very, very important decision. I think what's interesting too, when we look at this is if people are, are curious as to, again, the ownership rights that belong to an NFT are very specific um, and they're individual and unique to each sale, meaning that you can decide what you want to put up there. I think one of the ways that helps a lot of people to understand this is to think of it as a series of lithographs, for example, just because you buy number 43 out of 100 uh, uh, in terms of a lithograph of a painting, it doesn't mean you own the painting, it means you own that particular representation of it. And so depending on how the NFT is structured, you're getting getting a whole version and myriad of different digital rights. And again, we're talking only about the art world in this particular example, but um, that is really interesting. I think one of the, the two of the things that are really interesting, uh, uh, and then I'll finish up Eugene for, for the next question I think you wanted to have there, but it's very important that um, the reason there's also a big boom here is, is artists already have a hard time um, making money and monetizing and, and commercializing what they do uh, if they're not really well known and, and people buying $69 million paintings, that's not what this is about. Um, that's the that's the 1% uh, buying, doing something the 1% is always done. They're just doing it a different way. Um, that's cool, but okay. What's gonna become really interesting is is when this trickles down. And if you go to Clubhouse and, and listen to these rooms with digital art creators, if you look on Twitter and Instagram where they're all showcasing their stuff, these are people who are finally being able to monetize what they're doing and they're doing it because they have a community. Beeple didn't make $69 million off of that sale just because everybody was super excited about it. He did it because he has two decades of building a very, very strong community behind his brand that all got actioned whenever there was something to get behind. Obviously that moved into a different level of type of investors. But when we see this on places like Instagram and Clubhouse and, and elsewhere, we see a ton of unknown quote unquote artists in their smaller worlds, but with a significant and, and very interesting community behind them being very interested in being able to buy their artwork. And that democratization of this is super, super interesting. And I think that's where a lot of this has scaled. The, can't, the pandemic really pushed this as well. Artists weren't able to make money. This created a way for us to get into that. Um, but anyways, there's lots of other cool ways we're making money with NFTs. Thanks, Ethan. Yeah, on that note, Ethan, I know, you know for Ty, he's more in the art NFT space. And, and Ethan, you mentioned things like patents and things like that coming on the NFT. And I think, I've seen some weird ones where a tennis player uh, auctioned off a spot on her arm as an NFT and someone can 
place whatever tattoo they wanted on her arm. And so we're seeing a lot of these use cases where whether it's useful to have it as an NFT or not, it's to be seen. But what are some of the other use cases that you're seeing, Ethan, that you think will be here to stay? Yeah, uh, you know, so everything that's in digital collectibles is definitely a big thing, whether it's art or, or, or other stuff that's collectible. But we are also looking at patents, copyrights, trademarks, event tickets, um, things that not only exist as a unique item, but also potentially, and this is where the cool stuff comes in with NFTs, NFTs where you can include unlockable content or advantages into the NFT. So if you hold that ticket, um, then maybe that a specific ticket gets you into a, a, a VIP um, meet and greet or lets you buy certain merch at the event, things like that. Think of it like bonus content on DVDs. There's extra stuff because you got this special version. And we can be looking at purely virtual assets, but um, we can look at things like internet domain names. We can talk about legal documents, digital identities, uh, luxury goods is a huge space right now. Um, both LVMH has Aura uh, Consortium for their brands like Prada and Bulgari, Hublot, Louis Vuitton. Um, Ariane uh, is another one that has a consortium that's working with Richemont. Uh, so that's brands like Cartier, um, Breitling, um, Vacheron, things like that. Uh, so we're, you know, that's really interesting because you have the, the uniqueness of each item. Um, you want to be able to track uh, its, un its, its uniqueness, but also the fact that it's, uh, it's legitimate. Uh, these are items that potentially get resold. Uh, there's all kinds of things there. And then if you bake in more cool things into it, the two places we're seeing a ton of movement right now, um, we're seeing in the video game space where we wanna have cross-platform um, items, virtual items, like maybe the clothing that your avatar wears or certain tools or weapons or stuff like that. We wanna have that not only in one game, but we wanna take it somewhere else. So maybe you're in Fortnite and you bought this particular outfit, but you wanna be able to wear it in the other video game that you're playing. So be, imagine that for brands like Nike or, or, or uh, other things. So that's really cool. And the money right now, the huge money moving in NFTs is in sports. Uh, we have NBA Top Shots, which is a collectibles platform around NBA basketball stuff. They raised $305 million uh, uh, last month, uh, about maybe two months now, on a $2.6 billion valuation. Why? Because they've done $500 million in sales this year. Um, um, it's just insane. Uh, so Rare, which is a fantasy football uh, league, uh, uh, so a fantasy, um, well, soccer, but um, football for, for those of us on this side of the pond right now. Um, but the idea there being, you know, they just raised a $50 million Series A because think of it like a baseball card or, or, or another sports collectible card, um, but you're doing it in the midst of a game because it's fantasy football. And they have this baked in extra stuff I was talking about. So if you have Antoine Greitzman's card and you go to a match that he's playing at, you might get to meet him. You might get to sit in a special section. You get a special jersey, all kinds of things that are baked in depending on the, 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 the actual NFT. That's amazing. Um, and they're making, I mean, there's a fortune. I mean, what's going on right now in that space, the collectibles is just massive. The only thing holding it back is, is kind of the gas fees. That's a platform issue. But beyond that, this, it's already exploding. So it's just gonna get even bigger. No, thanks for that. And, and I know we have some questions coming in and we'll get to that in about five minutes. Um, Ty, I had a question. Well, I, I, I want to see if you want to chime in on that in terms of use cases and different trends you're seeing. For example, in the art world, I know, you know there was that Banksy piece that someone bought in the physical world, they burnt it, they made it into an NFT and people are doing a lot of interesting things. Um, can you talk a little bit about that in terms of what you're well, saying? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, the 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 the, the group they uh, actually burned the Banksy piece, and um, so that it would only exist um, as an NFT. And um, I mean, th th those kind of stunts are coming in for criticism, but people are making money from these kind of stunts. Um, the 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 major thing that's happening at the moment is that museums and galleries uh, and um, so on are looking at. Um, how to um, convert their entire inventory into NFT. So that's where the, the uh, big movement is at the moment. You also have a lot of the big foundations, the, the, the Picasso, Basquiat, and, 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 and Warhol and so on. And then they're following suit doing the very same thing. So insofar as um, uh, the, 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 the art world is concerned, right, the, the NFTs are here to stay. In terms of valuation, Ty, I know you mentioned, you know, there's a six to nine million dollar Beeples and there's, you know, the, the garbage NFTs that people are just like putting on there. But if you're an investor or if you want to get into this NFT space, 
what's kind of the work you do and how do you value these things? How should people look at these things when they, you know, want to get into this market? Yeah, well, on, on the valuation, that's an interesting one. Um, um, for the NFT of, um, a, 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 of a physical art of work, let's say if we had the rule of thumb of, of, of the value of a Picasso or, or so on of, of 20%. That would then give us um, a benchmark, you know, of guidance to valuation. But um, I think that they, there are a couple of companies out there who say they are valuing um, NFTs. But as you said, right, if someone comes along there and puts up uh, um, some of the stuff that's up there is not great, where's who, who is going to value them? Um, uh, you know, in so, in so far as uh, uh, the the valuation of, 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 of an NFT, you, you, you fall back in the tradition art world and, 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 and um, look at the guidance again from secondary market sales and, and auction and prices over a period of time. The same model then could apply to NFTs. Um, but that said, there's always um, passion buyers when they come out of the woodwork, like as we saw with the Salvador Monday for the 450 million or, or, or the people for 69 million. So it, it's from, from, from the valuation perspective, who, who, who can value them accurately when you have people um, um, uh, coming out of the woodwork and, and paying 69 million, let's say, for the people piece? On valuations, there's also a very interesting um, point to, to address in the digital art uh, side of this with things like the Crypto Turks and, and, and some of the stuff that's that's been selling. Like these things were given away for free in 2017, and now they're going for two or three million dollars uh, a piece. Some of that is because people really are, are very into the subject, but some of it is also that there are people who... Uh, in the crypto space, kind of the crypto whales that have you know hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of crypto that they have, that they're sitting on, and they want to see this. They want to accelerate um, the future of finance being decentralized, being tokenized, and so some of that is also people pushing a lot of money into this space because um, they care about the space, uh, and it's not necessarily not necessarily tied to an artistic um, valuation of those kind of assets. Uh, so there, there is an interesting space there that, that's, uh, that's odd. One of the interesting things too to look at with um, where a lot of the space is at is until we have fractional access into NFTs like we, we do with other tokenized assets, um, a lot of the high-end artwork is just not going to matter to the rest of the world because it's, it's like the rest of artwork. Um, most people either don't get it or they don't have the money to get into it. Um, and that's, that's very important. So, you know, on... Yes, there are cards on so rare that have sold for five hundred thousand dollars, but the average one's going for thirty to fifty bucks, and maybe getting, going up into a couple hundred bucks a couple months later, like the traditional trading card or, or comic book or other space. And so that's where the massive volume is is at, and I think will be when it comes to kind of the collectible side of where NFTs are at. Obviously, super great if we can also tokenize. Um, um, much more valuable artwork, especially for artists and the residual income aspect of this. But we also have to look at this democratization aspect, which is the true reason that most of these protocols are being built and other things happening. And that means a lower access point for people with lesser amounts of capital, but who still want to play um, in the asset pool of high-performing assets. Very interesting. Great. Um, I, Marty, I see on the podium, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to get back to what Ethan's talking about, and actually the group in general, and kind of get back into valuations. So I guess my question is, are you finding that there's a greater acceptance of digital assets? Because as I said, there's all these political forces at play. People are making negative statements, people are making positive statements. Corporations are, are buying, uh, corporate treasuries are buying uh, digital assets, or, or Bitcoin, for example. And I think that you've seen... Um, more and more countries that are really not necessarily they're like third world emerging uh countries and not really players in the currency markets are moving towards um digital assets to do transactions uh, i mean there's whole countries that that use bitcoin rather than their own currency if they can uh to do transactions um so are, are you seeing um you know wh where do you see valuations going number one and then number two um do you see greater acceptance? Like, are banks lending against Bitcoin? Because there's obviously with the IRS statements on taxing digital assets, it's, it's probably a smarter thing to do to um, uh, get a loan on your Bitcoin or your digital assets rather than to take a, to sell it and get a, a tax penalty. 
Any thoughts? There's two really interesting things there. Um, I'll, I'll deal with the second one first. Uh, so this is one of the things that if you listen to the DeFi panel beforehand, they, I, I, I didn't hear them talk a lot about staking in terms of the lending space. But one of the things that's really interesting is, is if you're sitting on Ethereum and you don't want to sell it because you're holding it over the long term um, or a bunch of other crypto uh, assets, uh, right now in the DeFi space, we have a lot of protocols uh, in the lending space to allow us to stake, which basically means um, I retain ownership of my Ethereum, but I put it into a platform that allows me to basically lend it. And now I make, I'm, I'm earning interest uh, on that, which becomes very interesting because now I am not creating the same capital gains uh, transaction of selling these things and moving it in and out of fiat currency. So staking in the DeFi lending space is, a, is one of the ways that lots of people who are sitting on um, crypto and want to leverage it um, are uh, doing that. Now, if we go back to the valuation space, I think it's very clear that that uh, there are a lot of organizations that have now fully embraced Bitcoin as a store of value, um, whatever that might in, end up meaning for how, how they handle this in the future. But if we want to talk specifically about the Elon Musk uh, scenario and whatever, this is, you know, more or less, you know, a game. Um, this is pure market uh, um, uh, manipulation in the sense of, oh, I think it's crap, but oh, I, I just bought a whole bunch more of it. Um, thank you for lowering the price. Oh, I think it's really amazing. Did I sell some of it now that I've made the price go up? And when it comes to Dogecoin and other things, there's a whole lot of BS going on here about pushing the values up and down. Um, but that does not mean that when we look at microstrategy, when we look at um, a lot of financial organizations beginning to put this on their balance sheet, we look at we work, uh, we look at um, uh, Twitter and Stripe and others that are saying they will accept crypto for payment, but they will hold it as an asset instead of using it to pay for the thing you were paying for. Um, store value is definitely something that's happening. Uh, point of very important order in all of this, Bitcoin over four years is up 200,000%. I don't give a crap what it did this weekend. So uh, Actually, I just want to make one comment and then the panelists can take over from here, but, but I think the smartest news organization in the world is WikiLeaks, who started taking payments in Bitcoin in 2016 or so. I mean, they've made a lot of money, of, uh, probably far more than the New York Times, uh, from their um, collection of Bitcoin and the increase, at least from the Treasury Services point of view. Anyway, continue. Yeah, if they held that, they definitely did well. I think they did. I mean, I don't, I don't think they bought pieces with it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. Um, it was there who did anybody want to chime in on that? I didn't want to monopolize the the, the discussion around the valuation idea. Hi, uh, did you have something there? No, on the valuation. I mean, um, and my position on the valuation is quite simple. It's very um from an art professional's point of view, it's quite difficult. I mean, and, and who does the valuation? Who are you going to rely on? There are people out there who are valuing the assets, um, but they are um strictly um, NFT art and, and, and not the other crypto products. I, I do have two questions with respect to NFTs. My first question, and please don't answer them first. Just answer, let me ask the two questions and then you can answer. My, my first question is, are the big players like the Christie's, et cetera, of the world, are they, you know, trying to get into the NFT market dominated? Like, I mean, you know, obviously the art houses have become le more lending firms than they are art dealers. So that's number one. Please don't answer yet. Um, and, and so that is NFTs. Number two, um, and this is for Eugene, if you're thinking about doing an NFT, who should you be talking to? You know, where do you go? I mean, besides going to Eugene Kim, you know, where do you go? Who do you talk to about the steps you need to take to make it happen? Ty? Uh, did you want to answer that first in terms of the first question? No, what was the first, yeah, what's the first question? I thought that was for Ethan. Sorry. So are the out art houses trying to, uh, to dominate the NFT market, the Christie's, uh, et cetera? Oh, they will do. They, they, they will do. I mean, um, you can see um, the, the uh, Beeple was the first one, and there's going to be many, many more to come. I mean, the, 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 the auction houses um, are known, and many of them for sharp practices, but they, they're also known for getting in on everything. I'll so, take a contrarian view to that. I'm um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Continue. Uh, I thought you were so, done. so, so o o over a period of time, after there's going to be so many auction sales, it's the same with any other artist. They're going to create a, a history, and there is the valuation. I completely agree when it comes to the high ticket um, artwork that that looks like the historical art and collectibles community that Christie's is known for. It's great that Christie's is getting into this 
earlier than later, but this reminds me a little bit of uh, a large newspaper deciding they want to build an online classifieds portal 10 years after Craigslist destroyed their entire business model. Um, I don't think that that's going to completely happen to Christie's because there are lots of physical things that will continue to be important as assets. I think they want to get into the digital space. That's great. But just NBA Top Shots and So Rare alone are a billion dollars a year in revenue and digital uh, uh, collectibles. Christie's isn't going to touch that. And they are nowhere near the other digital platforms of, you know, whether it's Showtime um, or Nifty Market or Rarible or OpenSea, which is like the uh, eBay of, 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 in, of digital art NFTs. Um, they, they have raised more venture capital, and that doesn't mean anything necessarily, but they've raised more venture capital this year than Christie's uh, uh, revenue. Um, so I, I think that Christie's and these other auctions houses will stay relevant uh, in the world they already are in. In the digital world, they're going to be important, especially on high ticket things. But again, the democratization of this is not all about $10 million pieces of art. It's about $500 to $2,000 or, or $10,000 pieces of art. And unless they're building a platform, which nobody's heard about, and unless they do it well, um, that's all going to belong to the internet uh, um, entrepreneurs behind that. So, so just uh, uh, Eugene, one second, but just just some thoughts about this, which is that um, so so you know people know copyright law in the U.S. and copyrights are supposed to expire over a amount of time, but for some reason our media companies keep on getting extensions on copyrights. Right? Could you imagine if the original Disney drawers who did Steamboat Willie or whatever, you know, with Mickey Mouse, uh, still got earnings from from their original drawings and, and animation. I mean, it, it's it's amazing how things may be or in the future if people who are the the originators of an artwork get more credit for it uh, in the future and it's it put to more use rather than kind of like um, uh, restraining uh, usage, um, but instead driving it. So. Uh, Eugene, where do you go for NFTs if you want to get started, if you want to look at it, et cetera? Yeah, uh, no, that's a great question. I mean, there's platforms like OpenSea um, where anyone can go um, or rarible.com. Uh, the problem with those sites, um, as you'll find out if you haven't you know, tried to mint something, there's these gas fees and they fluctuate depending on the time of day or what the price of the cryptocurrency is. And so sometimes you'll be minting something, it'll cost $200 and you're trying to sell for $10. So that doesn't really make sense. Um, I, I work with, so our company works with influencers and we work with brands. So if you have some sizable um, um, audience and you just need fulfillment and you need a, a partner to kind of create the NFTs and the whole fulfillment side, we definitely do that. Um, one plug I'll do is we launched um, something called NFT for Good, which was a charity arm that we um, created from our company. And we raised uh, over $80,000 for um, Stop Asian Hate and kind of the stuff that's going on the U.S. side with. You know, hate crimes and things of that nature. And so we're able to validate kind of, you know, mainstream adoption of these NFTs at a lower price point and not this frothy model of, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So uh, that's a little bit something I do, but there's definitely these um, open um, platforms where anyone can go and mint stuff, but whether you can sell them or not, you know, that's a different story. So, so, so Eugene, it sounds like there's a whole industry of people who have followers in the digital world and, and, and people like you come forward with ideas for them to, you know, make progress, you know, utilizing NFT. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And kind of like what uh, Ethan alluded to, we're finding when we tether these NFTs with physical merchandise or experiences, I know Gary V, you know, Vaynerchuk, he just launched something called V Friends, where you get, you know, uh, conference access if you buy these NFTs. So I think People are starting to do that a little bit more to familiarize why NFTs are, you know, valuable. Um, that you get something physical as well as this digital image that may or may not go up in value. And if you're not sure, at least you can say, "Hey, I'm getting some."